Thanks all for coming and for sticking around after lunch. I imagine you still want to be out there looking at the cute fish, but sorry, we're back in here. Um, our first presenter this afternoon is Steve Archer, who is an ecologist. He works in the School of Natural Resources and Environment at the U of A, and he does a lot of work on shrub encroachment, which is, I think, what he's going to tell you about. So, without further ado, Professor Archer. Thanks, Tom. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, uh, my background is plant ecology and ecosystem science. I'm at the University of Arizona. And what we've been working on, my students and colleagues and I over the years, are woody plant encroachment and sort of the ecosystem consequences of that. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Just a very quick overview of that. I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, I'm sure. We know, uh, in a, right in our backyard here, at the San Rita Experimental Range, the shrub encroachment phenomenon has been very well documented. That's where I'll be in the background uh, up there. Uh, we know that it's been occurring down the road a little further in the desert grasslands in the Hornada Basin. Uh, this is uh, a, a black ground of grassland photographed in 1903. There's that same mountain range in the background, re-photographed in 2001. So substantial encroachment and proliferation of the ski. And this is a global phenomenon. It's happening in, in rangelands worldwide. So here's an example of, of shrub encroachment in Mitchell grasslands of Australia. Well, rangeland ecologists and rangeland managers have had a long history of concern over shrub encroachment. And primarily, the considerations have been in the realm of the effects on livestock production, hydrology, and upland game management. And as a result of those concerns, uh, extensive field campaigns were, were instigated starting back in the 1940s and 50s uh, to manage the woody vegetation, try and push it back and regain uh, some of these uh, livestock production, hydrological, and game management uh, benefits. So this was quite a, quite a long history of these sorts of land management practices. Over the last 10 years or so, we've had a lot more concern about other sorts of impacts of woody plant encroachment on a diverse array of ecosystem processes, and factoring that into a more comprehensive assessment of what is the impact of this dramatic kind of vegetation change. And so, so woody plant encroachment now has been, um, we've got a pretty good history of, of uh, 10 years or so of really delving into some of the effects that when you change from a grass-dominated site to a woody plant-dominated site, how it affects these variety of ecosystem processes. The traditional considerations uh, remain important, but we're not trying to broaden our perspective so we get a broader portfolio uh, of, of things to consider. Unfortunately, we're way, lagging way behind in our understanding of brush management effects on these, these newer considerations. Well, here's an example just to illustrate a couple of points of some, of some shrub cover changes uh, in, the, in the Texas Rolling Plains. Uh, the Wagner Ranch, which is now for sale, by the way, if anybody's interested. <laughs> uh, the, these scenes are a, a large area, 400 square kilometers. We see it in 1937 and again in 1999. And the dark blacks and blues represent low cover. The reds and uh, hot reds and yellows represent high shrub cover. Green's kind of intermediate. And you see a couple of things when you look at this, this, the changes that have occurred over time. Here are two different things I've circled. You can see these areas were very open, uh, very low shrub cover. By the 1999s, very high shrub cover. Very low shrub cover, very high shrub cover. So this is consistent with what we've seen a lot of, around a lot of parts of the world. But wait, look at these other parts of the image. Look up here, dark reds. They're gone. They're now blues. We've gone from here down to here. Here's an area, lots of dark reds. Oh, now we're back to greens and blues. We've gone from here back to here. What's going on? Brush management. And so when we've got brush management, we're changing the mosaic and patterns of shrub cover that we see on the landscape. So these complex and shifting mosaics create big challenges for making regional assessments. How do you assess biodiversity on a regional scale when you've got shrubs coming and going in such a dynamic fashion? How do you make an assessment of carbon pools when you've got shrubs coming and shrubs encroaching in some areas, shrubs being uh, eradicated or pushed back due to brush management in other areas? What's the net outcome of that? Well, in this case, shrub cover, we've got a net increase of 30% over that time period. But then how does that change, uh, how does that relate to things like 
carbon mass and biodiversity and things of that nature. So what we're trying to do now is think of things in an ecosystem services context. A portfolio of information that a land management agency or a rancher can start pulling together to make some assessments about uh, the, the properties that they're concerned with. So there are a variety of different sorts of ecosystem services um, that are affected by woody plant encroachment on the one hand, but then they're also affected by these brush management practices, which might range from herbicides to mechanical treatments to prescribed burning to biological control with like goats and insects. And so the question is, you know, what are the net impacts of these changes over time uh, at a local, regional, and even continental scale? Well, we don't have time today to go into much detail on, on any of these, um, and not much detail on any one of them, for sure. But let's just take a quick look at a couple of things, like forage production. That's one of our traditional concerns. We know pretty well there's a pretty good body of literature indicating forage production will decrease when woody plants increase. The question then becomes, you know, does brush management effectively restore that decline in forage production if your land management goal or priority is livestock production? So here we're looking at changes in herbaceous production following brush management. Uh, we standardized it as uh, against annual precipitation. And we're looking at, at the zero line here, meaning if we go in and do the brush management practice on a site, a zero means there's no net change pre-treatment and post-treatment. Okay? And then we're looking at a lot of different sites. So this is a survey of, of many, many papers that are published in the scientific literature. And so what we see is that, is that a lot of sites don't respond positively to brush management. They don't change much. A few sites respond very positively, but as many or more sites actually respond negatively. And so one of the big questions we're trying to grapple with is why are some systems so unresponsive to brush management in terms of forage production? And equally importantly, why are some even adversely affected? And of course, these questions are important. Getting answers to these questions are important because that will help us decide when and where and what kind of brush management to, to in, engage in and where it might be most effective to give us the desired outcomes. Well, here's another perspective. This is herbaceous production following brush management treatment. And again, this is a survey based on uh, many, many, many sites across uh, the western U.S., and we're looking at years after brush management. So what we see is that there's a gradual ramp up in herbaceous production on average, but again, huge amounts of variability, but a gradual ramp up that peaks out after about five years on average, and then goes back to kind of normal. So again, that zero line means no net change. So yes, we can increase herbaceous production, standardized by rainfall a bit, but we go back to the pre-treatment conditions relatively soon. And so the real question is not, will follow-up management be necessary once we do some kind of a mechanical or chemical or pyrite management practice? The real question is, what kind of follow-up practice will we have to plan on and when will we have to implement that? Well, that's a forage production perspective. Let's take a quick look at carbon sequestration because there are lots of issues related to that now in the context of climate change. And if we can sequester more carbon by different land management practices and rangelands, then that's a potential uh, positive impact that can have uh, beneficial uh, consequences for land management. So what are the impacts of woody plant encroachment and brush management on things related to, to the carbon cycle? Well, here we're looking at changes in production, primary production. This is woody plus herbaceous. We know a lot about herbaceous production following brush management, and sorry, following woody plant encroachment, but we don't know much about woody plant production. So what happens when you combine the two? Because they're both out there on the landscape. They're both pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, right? So how does total primary production, grass plus shrub, change uh, as woody plants invade and establish in an area? Well, the answer depends on rainfall. If you're in a low rainfall zone, the xerophytic shrubs that are replacing the mesophytic grasses are less productive. 
So ecosystem primary production, grasses plus shrub, goes down when you get that conversion from grassland to shrubland. There's a bunch of areas in these intermediate precipitation zones, these semi-arid zones, where there's no net change. You're just changing out who's capturing the carbon, who's producing biomass, shrubs instead of grasses, but they're producing about the same. But as we get into these higher rainfall zones, we get a significant increase in total production when woody plants displace grasses. Okay, so there's a, this is good news because we've got a pretty good understanding of how primary production, total ecosystem primary production, grass plus shrub, might change when woody plants encroach. But the big carbon pool in rangelands, in arid and semi-arid systems, is below ground. That's where most of the carbon is, like 80 to 90 percent of it. So really what we want to know is how does, how does woody plant encroachment affect below ground carbon pools? Unfortunately, we don't know. <laughs> this is the kind of graph you hate to see if you're a research scientist. <laughs> Just this shotgun pattern. Okay, we, have, we have no ability to predict whether carbon in the soil will go up or down once woody plants approach. So again, we're trying to standardize this against, as, as a function of precipitation. Relative change in the carbon pool. Zero means no net change. Carbon's not increasing or decreasing in the soil when shrubs encroach. So in some, some systems it's big, other systems you get big losses. And on average, yeah, it's just all over the map. This is kind of disconcerting because we don't see a relationship then between above ground production and below ground carbon. <laughs> and ecological theory would say, no, if we know what above ground production's doing, we should be able to predict what's going on below ground. Well, so far, we're scratching our heads over this, and we're wondering, what are we missing? Why, why aren't we seeing a strong relationship <coughs> between above-ground production and the below-ground carbon pool? So this is a big area of research that's uh, ongoing. <coughs> well, what happens to ecosystem carbon with brush management? There's not a lot of data uh, on what happens following brush management with the above-ground carbon pool, because again, we're mostly concerned with the grasses, right? The herbaceous production. So we don't pay much attention to woody plant production. But here's a graph from some work done in Texas, uh, where we see that, you know, as you might expect, well, the answer depends on what kind of brush management practice, how long ago it was done. But in the absence of brush management, we get huge increases in the carbon pool above ground, which we'd expect. Uh, and in some cases where the brush management has been relatively recent, huge decreases. But then here's a lot of other areas with different combinations, fired several years ago, fired more recently, fire plus herbicide. You can generate these very complex mosaics and above ground carbon pools. And to complicate it further, soils matter. So you get different kinds of patterns whether you're on a clay versus loamy soil. Well, that kind of is a segue to say, well, then what does brush management do to below-ground carbon pools? Remember we said the below-ground carbon pool is huge. It's big. That's the, that's the elephant in the room. That's the one we really need to get a handle on. And unfortunately, we have really no good, clear, predictive ability about how the below-ground carbon pool changes with woody plant encroachment. So as you might expect, we're poorly poised to understand what's going to happen with brush management. And we don't even know what might happen because nobody's really looked at it. I only know of a couple of studies uh, where people have looked at below ground carbon following brush management. And one of them said no big change with root plowing or no roller chopping. Another one said a huge change, like 40 to 50 percent decline if you remove plants manually in a very highly controlled fashion. So we don't really know where the carbon story is going to go when you start superimposing brush management on top of woody plant encroachment. Another huge unknown below ground is that these woody plants are pumping a lot of carbon below ground in their roots. And a lot of that carbon is getting down deep where rates of decomposition are really, 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 really slow. <laughs> Did I make that point? <laughs> And so that carbon's going to be around a long time. So what happens to, with brush management kills the shrubs above ground? It's going to kill those roots below ground. That's a lot of carbon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that would reside in the soil, and especially if it's down deep. Okay? And so we have no idea what happens with brush management to the below ground root systems of these woody plants. 
And what we do know about a lot of brush management is it doesn't kill the plant. We say it top kills it. And then plants like mesquite vigorously sprout back. And so there's another variation on the what's going on with the roots story is, yeah, if you kill the shrub it's gonna, above ground, it's going to kill the roots below ground. But why did the shrub re-sprout? How much turnover or massive loss is there in these existing massive root systems? We have no idea. Well, what about biological diversity? That's another very interesting area, a very important area. And of course, we, we know that there are a lot of organisms that evolved with grasslands. They're basically grassland obligates. And so when we get woody plants encroaching into an area, those are going to be the first plants and animals to probably be lost from the site. And so, you know, a lot of times people talk about the numerical diversity, you know, the richness, how many organisms are out there, how many different species. That's important. But we can't, we can't lose sight of the fact that there are certain kinds of organisms that are unique to grassland ecosystems. And from a conservation biology perspective, we definitely want to keep those around. But it goes beyond the importance of organisms. I think we should also be thinking about ecosystem diversity. Grasslands and savannas as an ecosystem type. And some people argue, and rightfully so, that grasslands and savannas are endangered ecosystems. And they're under threat from a variety of sources, including cropping, overgrazing, exurban development, fire suppression, and woody plant encroachment, which are oftentimes associated with these various kinds of factors. Well, let's just take a quick look at what happens with herbaceous diversity when woody plants come into a system. And here's a database from Tallgrass Prairie and desert grassland. Declines very dramatically. We kind of expect that because we said earlier that herbaceous production really falls off the map too when woody plants encroach in many cases. And so we'd expect that overall diversity might decrease as well. So effectively what we've got, here's a case from uh, the Tallgrass Prairie. A Tallgrass Prairie, which is a diverse floristic compilation of herbaceous species, basically being converted to a monoculture juniper woodland. So tremendous impacts on, on plant biodiversity with then cascading effects to animal habitat and rodents, insects, uh, bacteria, fungi, etc. Well, what about brush management? Can brush management help us recover that lost diversity when shrubs encroach? Well, here again, we're looking at a map. Uh, this is years after a brush management treatment, and we're looking, we're comparing herbaceous diversity changes before and after the brush management. And so if the value is one, it means there's no net change. There's the same diversity before as there was after. And we're looking again at many, many different sites from across the western US. And it's similar to the story for herbaceous production. Uh, we see that herbaceous diversity can increase pretty substantially in some cases. But in a lot of other cases, it doesn't change significantly at all. And in other cases, you might actually get a slight decline in overall, in overall diversity. And like with herbaceous production, it's very short-lived. So you might get a stimulation in numerical diversity for five or 10 years, but then you're kind of back to where you started eventually. And the other thing that happens that we've got to keep in the back of our mind, well, it's got to go from the back of our mind to the front of our mind, is that it opens the door for, for weed and exotic plant encroachment when we do the disturbances associated with brush management. And in some cases, especially historically, we were planting non-native perennials um, as well, and those are now escaping and taking over. So things like buffalo grass is a good example of that. So the challenge then is to sort of say, taking all these different sorts of ecosystem services that might increase, decrease, or, or remain the same with shrub encroachment, get some objective accounting of those, and then get an objective accounting for how those will change if brush management is impacted. And uh, realizing that once you do brush management on a site, you're going to have to follow it up and do some kind of a treatment in the relatively near future. So what we've done is gone through the literature and try and characterize, well, with, will, will the responses for a given variable be positive or negative? So that's what the, the red and the, the green boxes represent. Or we don't know. It could increase, it could decrease. So those are big areas of uncertainty that we're trying to nail down. And so just a pointer to a poster over here that Scott Jones has. Scott's trying to work on some of these issues uh, at the La Cienegas just down the road a little ways. 
And so we've got a lot of work to do. We're actively engaged in it. So this is Scott and I at a meeting. And Gita and, Gita and Phil Hireman are actually back in refilling their glasses. <laughs> Thanks. Good time for questions. Where do you get that big of beer glass? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, you know, the English, they used to do like sell by the yard. Yeah. You get a yard of beer, a half yard of beer. <laughs> Those are embarrassing, though. I mean, the first couple of sips are pretty good. But then you get down to it where it's only that bulb. And then, it's, and then, and then of course, by then you're a little bit tooted. And so then you got these, there's this in, inflection point where pretty soon there's this little tidal wave of beer coming at you. <laughs> and you end up wearing it instead of drinking it. So you only do it when. What's that? You can also drown. <laughs> yeah, you might need, uh, C, yeah, you might need CPR after. Yeah, so, so I would recommend uh, drink the good beer from a glass and the cheap beer from the. From the yard. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, question. Uh, on your studies, you know, you, you're comparing 1930 livestock production with contemporary and the uh, techniques have changed so radically now that how is that viable to compare 1930s to today? Well, you mean the, that graph that I showed of the or change in woody plant cover? <coughs> that because, you know, because like nowadays, uh, it used to be grazing was you put your livestock out yeah. and they ate. Yeah. And you know, that was it. <laughs> and then look, nowadays the common practice is to continually move your, your, your stock around so that no area is over overgrazed yeah. or over stressed. Yeah. That brings up a really good point that you know for a long time in, in the in the range management realm, people worked on grazing management. People worked on brush management. And then people stepped back, stood back and said, well, wait a minute, don't the two kind of go hand in hand? And so back in, you know, in the early 80s and into the 90s, people actually started saying, you know, we've got to do this integrated management of grazing and woody plants. We can't just focus on grazing and hope the brush takes care of itself. The other thing that I think that, that your question brings to mind is that, that we tend to view woody plants uh, as the problem. And historically, you know, there's kind of the only goody wood plant's a dead woody plant. Um, and that's because they were viewed as having this big overall negative impact on livestock production, which was the, which was a, a, the narrow focus uh, for, for income at the time. But you can turn that around and say the shrubs aren't the problem. The shrubs are the symptoms of some larger problem. They're a manifestation of some other things we've changed, and we've got to get on top of those. Uh, before we solve the shrub encroachment problem. Uh, I, I'm going to have to, just for the sake of time, I have to cut you off. I'm sure Steve will be available. Yeah, I'm